So our bed and breakfast um, yarn was our, it's kind of our flagship yarn or our signature yarn. It's the first yarn we ever made as a, as a company. And we got to the point of making yarn. Previous to that, I was um, designing knitwear and publishing patterns, but we hadn't been making our own yarn I, for our clubs. And, and even for the first Bare Naked Wolves Club, we sourced our yarn from other companies. It was very difficult to do because it's hard to find a company that can produce an undyed natural wool yarn that involves the animal, the particular animal I'd like to study <laughs> in the quantity that we needed for our club at the time, which at the time we were ordering, you know, six to 800 skeins of yarn for our, our club shipments. So, um, that be just became a, a big challenge. This particular installment of the club, I wanted to design a sock and I wanted a yarn that would be a very good sock yarn in a natural color, in a truly undyed color. And it was not easy at all to find any, much less any that was produced in the quantity we needed. So I was visiting with a friend and she worked in the yarn industry at the time. And she said, why don't, you know, maybe it's time to think about having a custom yarn spun for your club. And I just thought, wow, I never really thought about, it. I never really thought about that before. I had friends that would say, you should, you should start a yarn company. You know, you, your love of fiber and hand spinning is um, really well informed and um, you just love it so much. You should start a yarn company. And I was always like, yeah, maybe next year, you know? <laughs> so when we got into this club and doing this club that revolved around natural yarns, I was really forced to consider that seriously and actually dive in. So I just called a mill that was kind of in my region and it was in another state, but not very far away and asked if I could get a custom yarn spun. And they were like, sure. <laughs> so, so we just got started. And the first, and I explained what I wanted, that I wanted to do something that, um, involved alpaca and the mill suggested blending it with, I, I originally thought about doing 100% alpaca, but I knew as a knitter that that would not be, it wouldn't have much body and the socks would slide down and they wouldn't be elastic, you know? So I wanted to have uh, some versatility with this yarn to be able to design something and not be restricted to just something specific. So I talked to them about what we could blend the alpaca with and she suggested merino. And while she had access to superwash merino, which was the first thing I was considering for the sock yarn, she highly recommended that we go with an, a, a non-superwash wool. And at the time, this was all very new to me. And my mission about making yarn wasn't you know, solidified as much. So, you know, that was kind of why I leaned toward the superwash in the first place. But, but then when I thought about it, I, I agreed with her that the, the non-superwash, non-treated, untreated wool would be better. And it really does have more body and more spring and it retains its elasticity better. And that would offset the alpaca, you know, really well. So we decided on the blend and I asked for just a little bit of nylon to be added to this fingering weight so that it would truly be um, a sock yarn that would wear well. I mean, alpaca has a lot of good characteristics to be a sock yarn. And a lot of people might not think that right off the bat, but finer than, oftentimes finer than wool, alpaca is very is a lot stronger. It has a higher tensile strength. It resists pilling and shrinkage, and it's very warm without being heavy. It also does, some alpaca does wick moisture away from the body along with, um, and that's where a blending fiber comes in. When you blend fibers in a yarn, you get to take advantage of the good characteristics of every fiber that's included. So adding Merino, which is also a really great wicking fiber and has a lot of body and springiness to it would really play well with the alpaca. For a sock yarn, you want something that's round and cushy and knits up to a very 
springy fabric and a fabric that has really good recovery. So adding the merino to the alpaca made a lot of sense. And um, going with the untreated alpaca meant adding a little bit of, you know, it would be, a, it wouldn't be as easy care, a yarn or a fabric to take care of, but I think overall the benefits outweigh the outweigh that. There are lots of um, very small production farms and mills out there that do produce really nice blends, breed specific yarns, but, and it's just really hard to find them. So when we were sourcing for this club and this yarn, that was another reason that, you know, it was faster and efficient to go straight toward the custom production of our yarn. <laughs> and then once we saw it and it was so beautiful, we also decided to add like a DK weight and bring it out as as a yarn, a yarn line. So that's kind of how we came to doing a custom yarn in the first place. And and this mill, after they produced a couple batches for us, it was a lot for them. And they decided they didn't want to commit to working with us kind of ongoing. So we sought out other places to get our yarn spun. And, and then at that time found a mill here in Ohio that was kind of just getting off the ground and was looking for a steady commercial client. And they took over making our better breakfast, our breakfast blend yarn. It was around 2015 or 16 that, or probably 2014 or 15. And when we went to that mill, First of all, they were raising alpacas. So they were very involved in the alpaca community. And they started a mill in order to service the contacts that they had in, in the alpaca um, community. Realized fairly soon that they couldn't really exist or keep going just on those clients. So they, they started partnering with us in order to have a consistent kind of commercial client that would just, they would always be running yarn for us. And that worked out as a real win-win for both of us. And they had really great suggestions and they were willing to try all different kinds of blends for us. Um, not just alpaca blends, but, um, one of the things that they suggested for our yarn, which the original alpaca blend was called breakfast blend and the colors were all named after breakfast foods but when we started working with this mill they suggested de-herring the alpaca to take it kind of um up another notch you know take the yarn to another level and that's where we really got when we started using the de-haired alpaca that's when the yarn got a lot silkier and um we noticed a a kind of a change in the gauge with it where it wasn't quite as round, but it was so much softer. I mean, so many people thought it had cashmere in it. And the de-herring process is simply alpacas for the most part, most of the commercial alpaca that's available now comes from a double coated animal. And those alpacas have a hair coat and a fluffy, very soft undercoat. What you want for premium yarn is to access as much of that undercoat as possible. But in the alpaca um, community and industry, you can, if you're a, a grower, a producer, you can send any level of fleece to the alpaca co-op and it will be graded. And the grading process takes into account how much of the fleece consists of hair and how much consists of undercoat and or fine wool you know a fine wool fiber and the grading of that fiber um, goes from the lowest grades have more hair and the highest grades have less hair or no hair in addition to grading the actual quality of the fiber itself you know how strong it is how um, how beautiful a sheen it has, you know, it, is there any breakage? Is it healthy? But the amount of hair definitely contributes to the level of grading happens around the alpaca fiber. So a lot of, of alpaca wool blends that you see out on the market are much less expensive. But when you look closely or even not so closely at them, you can see that hair 
sitting right on top of the yarn sometimes. And when you knit with it, it'll shed all over your lap as you're knitting. And what the, it's a, it's very straight kind of prickly hair and it doesn't mix well with the actual alpaca fibers. So the yarn tends to shed the hair as you work with it. Um, and even like I said, sometimes I've been in yarn stores where I see <clears throat> skeins of alpaca yarn that just have all this hair crisscrossed over the surface. It's like, oh, no. but that's, I think, one of the things that makes alpaca fiber feel like it's producing a, an allergic reaction with people. Um, it, the hair can be prickly and it can irritate your skin. The, the stiffness of it can make it kind of scratchy against your skin. And that's the other thing about alpaca that makes it a really nice fiber for socks and garments that are um, worn close to the body is that alpaca does not have lanolin. So it, for people that are allergic to lanolin, um, they don't get that irritation and it's a, a hypoallergenic fiber um, for them to, to wear. So anyway, getting back to why this is a good, um, this is a good yarn for us. It was, um, it was a nice way to um, also segue our club onto uh, more adventurous and um, and and onto, I guess, talking about animals with a deep history. Um, and a rich cultural um, connection. So the um, the alpaca animal is um, belongs to the South America camelid family, which includes um, llamas, vicuña, and guanaco as well. The African and Asian camels are actually distant relatives of this uh, strain of camelids. The ancestors of the alpaca were thought to have migrated from um, North American, the North American Southwest to the Andean region more than 50 million years ago. When they became extinct in the North, their wild ancestors were domesticated in the South and evolved into what we know today as alpacas and llamas. DNA studies show us that the smaller single-coated alpaca is the result of selective breeding of the vicuña stock and that the larger double-coated llama is a direct descendant of the guanaco. So within the camelid family, you have... Um, Vicuñas and alpacas from one strain of DNA and guanacos and llamas from another strain of DNA, but they are closely related. Um, get, and down the road a little bit, we'll see that they actually do can interbreed. So they're close enough in their DNA to, to be able to produce offspring together. Domestication of the alpaca um, seems to have occurred independent of and earlier than the llama probably around 7,000 years ago. So curiously, both animals have, both the alpaca and the llama um, appear to have been bred quite early on in mankind's own journey for, but for different reasons. So with the llama was employed mainly as a transportation and pack animal, alpacas were bred for fiber production. So late enough in the evolution of mankind to be seeking um, fiber for making clothing and uh, household items. Alpacas as a breed are, they're very tolerant of harsh um, climatic conditions as well as um, um, very tolerant of deprivation in terms of food and water. They're also highly disease resistant. Um, and, and as we've talked about, which if you're brand new to this, you haven't talked about it, but um, as we've talked about with other animals, harsh climatic conditions are one of the big factors in producing fine, um, warm, 
um, luxurious fiber. So for instance, cashmere goats, uh, goats that produce a lot of cashmere, uh, a marketable amount of cashmere, live in very, very harsh conditions. And alpaca is the same. You can breed them elsewhere, but they will produce, the more highly productive ones are produced, are living in more harsh conditions. There are approximately three and a half million alpacas in the world today. And about 80% of them live in Peru at, um, ten, at uh, um, an altitude of 10,000 feet above sea level. So there's a high concentration in one fairly small area of the world. If you look on a map at Peru, it's, you know, compared to the rest of the world, it's a pretty small place. The remaining 20% of alpacas are spread mostly across Bolivia, Chile, Argentina, the United States, Australia, and Great Britain. So 75% of the world's, of, I'm sorry, of Peruvian alpacas are held in the care of traditional herders. Um, and this species are divided into two types. So the domestic, um, alpaca as we know it are divided into um, Huacaya alpacas and Surrey alpacas. 90% of them are Huacayas and 10% are Suris. The difference is, and we've done both types in our club. Um, down the road, we may do uh, Surrey alpaca yarn again, but we did do it a few years ago and had a whole chapter on that in one of the ebooks um, because it's such a specialized um, sector of the alpaca family. But Hokai alpacas have short crimped fibers that have kind of a spongy appearance similar to that of a sheep. I'm going to show you a picture. Let's see. So here's one in full fleece, like just before shearing. So you can see how long and fluffy they get. And this is um, one that would be grazing out, you know, kind of um, in the, not, I don't want to say in the wild, but it's, it's on a range. So it's not, it's, it's domesticated, but not, um, in a small holder's farm. Now here's one from a farm that um, some people that I know have, and they're, <laughs> um, you'll see why I'm giggling. So these are their alpacas <laughs> and you can see how fluffy they are and how um, when they're sheared, they're also somewhat groomed. You know, they are cleaner and um, they're, their their coats have been sheared to have a shape to it almost like a I always think of these alpacas as like poodles <laughs> so um depending on how many alpacas you have and your situation in, in terms of where you keep them you can keep them um fancier and, and cleaner and also um these people show their alpacas so their alpacas need to be groomed somewhat differently than someone who's herding alpacas out on the range. Okay. Anyway, the Hokayas have that round fluffiness to them. And when their coats are even a little shorter than this, they look, you know, they look a lot like a sheep. Um, Suris have straight, silky locks that fall they fall into almost like dreadlocks and they they get very long like up to i think uh 48 inches or something like that they can be it just uh kind of depends on how tall the animal is and how much of a fleece they can carry but i've seen them at shows where their locks are falling all the way from the top of their back to the floor and when they prance along the silky fibers dance kind of jog up and down it's they're very fancy <laughs> and they and they seem to know it so um the surrey type of alpaca is very very silky and soft it doesn't have the crimp 
it doesn't have any crimp really it's just kind of an s-shaped fiber that falls into a spiraling lock a lot like a um a lot like a mohair goat um does where the hokayas have a uh, crimpy springy fiber that is it's it has more versatility as a spinning fiber because of its crimp and its loft. Um, so alpacas were initially domesticated in the in the Inca Empire, which existed from approximately um, 1400 to 1525 BC and was one of the most prominent civilizations of the Americas. Um, it exerted power and influence over what is now present day Southern Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, Bolivia, and the Northern reaches of Chile and Argentina. Alpaca and llama were treasured within the Inca civilization and played an integral role in their everyday life. The animals were used for garments, fertilizer, fuel, hides and meat, as well as transportation for goods and communications. Processing of alpaca wool was central to life in the empire. Everyone was involved in the wool industry, working within the program to established by governing authorities. So it was, you know, highly regu regulated and, um, and very, and they considered the wool to be very precious. So it it was a an industry akin to what we have today as a cashmere industry or a silk industry um very the the breeding was very pure and regulated and the treatment of the fleece was also um very very highly specialized um after shearing, fleece was stored in royal warehouses to be distributed according to each family's needs. Wool processing was largely the domain of ink and men, while women were assigned tasks of spinning and weaving. Royal administrators supervised the distribution of supplies and the quality of work. Agriculture, textiles, metallurgy, and pottery were the most important economic activities of the Incans, who developed a high a highly evolved standard for fabric design and quality. Textiles had practical religious and social significance within Incan culture, representing the most prestigious of gifts. Citizens that distinguished themselves in serving the empire were rewarded with clothing. The finest alpaca and vicuña fiber was so valuable that it was worn and used only by Incan royalty in cloaks, robes, rugs, hangings, and wall tapestries made from fine alpaca that had a silky sheen and colors that were not yet known in Europe. So um, dyeing was also a highly specialized um, craft and the people who did it were ranked very high in the, in the royal court. Fine fibers and textiles were precious to the Incas in the same way that gold was to the Spaniards. They considered the alpaca a source of wealth and used it as legal tender. Clothes and textiles were exchanged during diplomatic negotiations. The dead were buried in their finest clothing and textiles were burned in offerings to the gods. Soldiers wore textiles with colored feathers while young boys of noble lineage received robes made with gold and silver thread during their manhood initiation ceremony. So that was the heyday of the Incan culture and alpacas were um, at the top of their game in terms of notoriety, breeding and fiber production during this time. The Spanish conquest, conquest of South America in 5, 1532 had a disastrous effect on both llama and alpaca populations. The Spaniards considered they were they were in South America for gold. So the whole their whole view of 
animal production and and the worth of animals and the worth of the Incas, you know, the their whole misunderstanding of their culture and um, their values led to a really disastrous um, future for both the Incans and the alpaca and llama populations. Um, the animals now considered to be of little value to the Spanier, Spaniards were herded together with European animal stock and driven from the coastal and valley terrain where they had been raised. Um, and so massive mortality was the first result of that displacement as the herds were pushed to extreme high elevation um, pastures where they're, where that's where they're mostly found today. In addition, the Spanish introduced their own livestock, sheep, goats, and cattle, um, and mixed them all in, um, bringing with them diseases that affected both the animals and the native Indian populations. So that um, experienced herders and breeders decreased in number as well. Um, the handling of llamas and alpacas became disorganized and left to people who didn't know what they were doing. Um, and the, the highly regulated breeding programs were, were um, left unchecked and were eventually lost. But, the, but a large amount of unchecked crossbreeding um, was the negative result of that. Because alpacas and llamas interbreed readily, the situation evolved to a point where it's kind of challenging today to locate and study pure alpaca animals. Um, and I just want to show you another, an illustration and a couple of photos. So um, this is an, this is a, a antique illustration of of alpacas, llamas, and vicuña kind of next to each other. Um, remember again that the alpaca is um, kind of a descendant of the vicuña. Um, so it has some of its characteristics, but not all. And the vicuña is a, is a wilder, um, is wilder with pu more pure genetics. And so it's, it's leaner, <clears throat> the, the uh, fiber coat on it is not as long. The, the alpaca is a little bit um, deceptive because part of the length of the coat is the hair coat um, being long and the hair coat protects the undercoat, which allows it to be, um, to grow a little bit longer, I would imagine too. The vicuña only has the soft fiber coat. It doesn't have a hair coat. So its fleece is a little more exposed. Um, it's under, you know, the coat that it carries can be shed more, you know, if you don't catch it at the right time when it's ready to shed so that it can be combed out, um, the fiber will just be lost. It'll just fall to the ground. The llama you can see here has a slightly different shape to their head is longer with a longer um, muzzle. The ears are very tall and the neck is a little bit longer and a little more curved. And the flanks of the animal are much longer. So it's got a longer body. The legs don't produce as much hair um, and its body is suited more to carrying and, and carting things than um, to the production of fiber, which it does produce fiber, but the fiber is a uh, much less quality than the alpaca. And I'll show you um, some actual, I wanted to show that illustration so you could see the animals next to each other. But I also have photos here of, this is the vicuña. Um, in its kind of natural, I, I say natural with air quotes, habitat, because the areas where these animals uh, roam now are really kind of national parks and they're highly protected park areas. They're not 
they don't really roam on their own as, as much as um, they might want to because their breed needs to be protected more nowadays. So this is the Vicuña. You can see it has this really soft fiber coat, but it's very short. And much of its body really doesn't have, a, um, isn't, isn't producing a fleece. So it just has short hair on its face and legs. And then this is, uh, let me see here. This is a, this is a llama. This is a really nice llama. And um, this is a, I think this actually is a guanaco. So this is the purebred llama that hasn't been crossbred at all. Um, and guanaco produces a fleece coat and a, as well as a hair coat. It's, um, I don't know that there's anything super special about the guanaco fiber. It's, it's, it's a bit softer in the, in the um, herds that are protected since they breed only with each other and their, um, their treatment is, you know, more natural and they're not used as pack animals. Um, the fleece is able to be um, preserved in a, in a better state. And then this is another, one more photo of uh, a guanaco with its more summer coat. So you can see this is a really large animal. The, um, the, the coat here is not that full, you know, it hasn't developed its full winter coat. It's kind of got spaces in between some of that hair um, those get kind of filled in a little bit more as winter comes on, just like any, just like most dogs or, you know, cows or any animal that, um, you might have contact with. They have a, a kind of lighter, um, less fluffy coat in the summer. Okay. Where was I here? Um, Okay, so the because the breeding programs for alpaca for just alpaca alone were um, let go and lost, um, the alpacas and llamas began to breed interbreed, and nowadays, and that's where the Huacaya alpaca, you know, took root. That separation between the llama and the alpaca didn't exist anymore where um now the al now the alpaca had um hair interspersed within its fleece coat and it um some have more than others but um now we have these mixed coated animals and the same thing on the llama side too the the llama the llamas developed uh, the ability to have an undercoat. Um, it's still not llama. The llama undercoat is never. Um, it, it's not quite the same quality. Although it is the llama, the one thing we do get from the llama now is that downy undercoat. Um, in fact, our stone soup blend has some llama in it llama fiber. And when we talk about llama fiber, the only really usable fiber from the llama is that undercoat in terms of making textiles. The hair coat is used for all kinds of things, um, can be used for all kinds of things, rugs and felting, felted objects and um, insulation and all kinds of things. But the undercoat is actually very, very fine, like dryer lint and highly prized blending fiber. All right. So the alpaca remains a key component in the, to the economy of over 65,000 Andean families who live and work as herders and breeders in remote areas under extreme conditions. 
Um, they share the native environment with the animals that they herd. And these herders practice traditional breeding system. Women may, and mostly the men. So the male, the males do the herding and the breeding and the women maintain the spinning and weaving traditions, producing rugs, clothing, accessories, and decorative items that are worn by their families or sold at local markets. Alpaca meat is the main source of protein in the daily diet of native herders um, who sell and trade excess fleece at market to obtain other essential household items um, with cash. The fleece, the, the alpaca fleeces are usually purchased by large processors and then, pro, you know, cleaned and resold on the domestic or the global fiber market. But it, the raw fleeces go through several hands before getting to the global market. And that's um, one of the reasons why the prices are, you know, higher for this fiber. Peru remains the largest producer and exporter of alpaca fiber and fleece, and they ship approximately 4,000 tons of alpaca fiber annually with Italy, China, and Great Britain as the top three um, importers um, from the Peruvian market. Peru exports nearly 40% of its ready-made alpaca products to the USA, making it the top market for textiles, clothing, and accessories made from alpaca. From 1931 to 1993, the export of alpaca animals was banned by Peru in order to protect the population, which was in decline, and its own tenuous hold on the global fiber supply. So um, there was this period of 60 or so years where um, there was no way to get alpaca fiber except through Peru, unless you got it through Peru, but through a secondary market in Italy or Great Britain. In 1993, when the government determined that the alpaca population had bounced back to an optimum level, they authorized um, herds to be exported to the United States United States, Australia, and the UK. And today, these three countries have the largest alpaca populations outside of the Andean region. The American and Australian breeder societies have closed pedigree lists to discourage further import of alpacas and to allow their own alpaca populations to grow and develop. The goal being to breed um, native alpaca strains on American soil and Australian soil for export um, and to establish on, onshore fleece and fiber industry. So as we've talked about with um, different sheep um, like the Gotland and um, the Wensleydale, I think we talked about this. Once, once the sheep has been taken from its native environment and um, bred and populated another environment for long enough, there are, there are, there is a likelihood that the fleece quality and lots of other things about the animal can change if the animal is solely bred on another, in another geographic climate. Um, for instance, the United States has mountains and we have we have harsh climates, but nothing like the high Andes mountains. We don't we just don't have that here. So and many people who want to breed alpacas don't live in our harshest climates, our own um, high mountain areas are more populated by tourist attractions than uh, ranches and farms. 
so we have a kind of you know we are are geographic and uh and, and we like to in the united states we like to breed animals close to transportation where the where because we're such a big country um where it's a little bit easier to get fiber to market than uh than it is in a place like peru and also we have very centralized areas or centralized locations for processing fiber. Um, you can breed alpaca in many parts of the United States, but the places where you can send the fiber to be graded and processed are very few, extremely few actually. So it's um, it makes it difficult and very expensive to get your fiber to market. So those are all considerations for um, why the breeding of alpacas in the United States is very different than it is in Peru. Um, and that does lead to differences in the fiber itself. So rather than try to aspire to achieving a Peruvian standard of fiber, the breeding societies in the United States and Australia and elsewhere, the UK as well, um, have decided to focus on their own upbreeding programs to develop the best alpaca animals and the best alpaca fiber that these locales can can produce, and that will, and if successful, will um, provide some latitude in the global market and some variety within the breed that that could be a good thing um let's see the alpaca that we use now is in the better breakfast now and we've gone through quite an evolution of um sourcing alpaca from different places um but currently the mill that makes our better breakfast yarn has fallen in love with this um fiber that they bring in from a Peruvian co-op. So where, um, where we started out sourcing our fiber domestically, it has gotten, um, what we have found, and we found this with other fibers in the past that we talked about, like the organic cotton fiber, it's actually got a smaller carbon footprint when we bring it in from Peru. So um, for myriad reasons from the way that they, from the feed that they give their animals there to the, um, the c conservation of water that they have there to the um, localization of the processing plants so that it's, um, you know, using much, much less modes of transportation the fleece is traveling much less far and not crisscrossing the country a as much. And so we actually find that transporting it from Peru to the Midwest here is much less expensive than sourcing it, say in Texas or um, even some of the areas close by that we used to source from. I mean, we used to get fiber from Pennsylvania and Ohio and Michigan, but um, it was very expensive and it wasn't as cleanly raised um, fiber as we get from Peru. So it's also really, really good quality. So that's another factor. So you balance all of those things um, and come up with the best what you can do to get the best choice for both for three reasons for quality environmental concerns and and price and you know and and quality being the most important okay um another thing about the peruvian facility that produces this fiber is that they use um, the, the fleece that they get 
is very, very, very low in the hair. And so they are able to get almost all of that hair out just by spinning it and not, and you know, the regular processing and almost, they almost don't have to use the dehairing equipment at all. So that's another energy saving um, facet to sourcing the fiber there. All right, let's talk a little bit about the fiber itself. Um, the alpaca fiber it has a very fine, light fleece. It's soft and durable and luxurious and silky. It's similar to sheep's wool in its actual chemistry, but it's warmer and it has no lanolin. So that makes it hypoallergenic. Um, the presence of hollow core hairs in the fleece increases its thermal qualities and allows it to resist solar radiation, providing the animal with a permanent protection against extreme climactic change. So, what that means is that the fibers themselves are, are cannular or tubular. They're actually hollow and they function like a, like an ampule. Um, the air inside that, that tube acts as an insulator for the animal, because as we know, it's when you contain air, that's insulation. The fiber itself isn't necessarily the warming factor. It's the trapped air that that warms us and them. So the hollow core fiber uh, provides them with um, both the ability to stay warm in the winter and cool in the summer. And so it allows them to be in these extreme conditions um, and to roam mostly on their own without interference. The, the parks that, that contain the uh, the uh, vicuña populations are highly guarded uh, those um, animals are protected with everything the Peruvian government has <laughs> um, and and so it's not possible to get in there and you know fawn over the animals and 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 keep a super close watch on them alpaca fiber um, has a structure um, Again, similar to sheep wool, but it's both stronger and softer. The fibers that have scales, the scales are shorter and flatter than those on the wool fiber. And that, sorry, my throat is dry. Um, and that translates to an increased luster, wrinkle resistance, um, low pilling, and, um, and an overall silkiness of the fiber. And at the same time, while the fiber is being processed, the, those char characteristics reduce friction and, and um, stickiness you know, between the fibers. So the resulting roving and spun yarn tends to be more limp um, and splitty and has poor recovery as, as a knitted fabric, but also doesn't felt as easily. So those scales being um, flatter and smaller mean that they don't bloom out and catch on each other and make the fibers get tangled together. Um, and that keeps it very silky. So what that means for us is that the resulting fabric can have stitches that separate easily, um, though those properties highlight irregularities in tension or texture. And in addition, the lack of springiness causes garments to become shapeless rather quickly. You can add more twists to a yarn to give it more body, but um, that can reduce the softness that you, that we love about alpaca fiber. So it's better to kind of work with the fiber and make the most of its strong points, then try to fight it and make it do what, you know, what it's not really intended to do. So there are two types of alpaca fiber, as I mentioned earlier, the huacaya, 
which is 90% of the fiber produced um, or the animal population. And Hokkaia is crimpy and more elastic and better suited to hand knitting, while Suri works well for lace knitting and woven goods because its extreme drapiness um, is desirable in those kind of garments. Um, and extra, extra structure, structure can be built in with, with weaving patterns and um, blocking in, in the case of lace fabric. <clears throat> another way to um, another way to use alpaca and to make it more feasible for more different kinds of products is to use it in a fiber blend as we've done with this um, better breakfast yarn. The pairing of the fibers makes the most of their strong points and results in a, per a performance of the yarn that's kind of better than the sum of its parts. Um, again, we've chosen to blend the strong moisture resistant alpaca with soft springy merino top um, for its wicking ability and its volume. Knowing that we were going to be working with socks and, um, you know, and also that knitters just love a cushy yarn. You know, we all just love a yarn that has a nice springiness to it. But knowing that, um, that we wanted this yarn to be able to wear well, specifically for socks, we added that small percentage of nylon to, um, to give it a little more durability. One thing that sets up, another thing that sets alpacas apart from sheep wool is the wide range of natural colors that the animal presents. Um, it, it is a really special characteristic among fiber animals that, um, that it has so many. In America, uh, Hawkeye alpaca is classified into 16 natural colors with an even wider range of shades from true black through uh, browns, fawns, white, silver grays, and rose gray. And I just wanna say the rose gray is a special um, gray that's produced with a, it has a pinky blueness to it. So um, we actually have two colors I just want to show you, we have our Better Breakfast is available in 11 different shades in the fingering and DK weights. And in the worst of weight, we have slightly fewer shades, but our shades really represent the whole range of the, of the fleece colors. And I'm just going to grab a few things so I can show. These are a couple of browns and grays. You can see that these are more blue, blue gray, and these are the warm, toasty browns they have a real caramel component to them um so where in sheep wool we say gray and you may get anything from a brown to a blue gray with alpacas the gray is is blue gray it it's um it's a a subset of black a true black and the browns go from this super dark brown all the way to the a milky fawn color and white. So they're very warm and toasty. And of course you can mix them. So these are kind of clear cut brown and gray colors. And then, <clears throat> and then these are like mixes of gray brown colors. So when you put this next to the true brown, you see that chocolatey brown and this one has a little more gray to it the mocha and this gray it's very dark but when you put it next to the cooler gray you can see the brown that's kind of mixed into it or i can anyway and then the rose gray is so interesting so here's our here's our blue gray and our chocolate brown and then here's the rose it's got this, um, it's like, 
it sits on the fence between the two. When you put it, you know, when you put it next to a brown, you can see a lot more of the gray in it. But when you put it next to a gray, the warmer tones come out. And so um, it kind of straddles the gray and the brown. And um, we have this in two shades. This is the darker, the muesli, and then the porridge is a, a paler shade of the rose gray. Um, this has a little bit of a, a few other colors mixed in, but um, largely we're using the rose gray here. It's kind of a special, more rare um, color. The, the color range is wide, but it, it isn't evenly distributed. So there's actually quite a bit of black alpaca out there and lots and lots of white as with all other fiber producing animals today. Um, and plenty of gray, but the, um, I'm sorry, plenty of fawn, but the silver gray and the rose gray and, and a reddish, there's a reddish brown that I'm always craving to get. And we, it's so hard to get. It's like a cinnamon brown and um, it's part of the brown range, but it really has a, a redness to it, a, a more orangey color. And I'm always asking, can, can you keep your eye out for that? <clears throat> Thinking that it would be a really good club. It would be a, a wonderful barn box um, addition to, to get some of that, but it's kind of like getting more, more at color in, in wool. So that's a little bit about the alpaca colors. And we take advantage of getting whatever colors we can and blending them. We have, uh, like I said, we have 11 shades and we don't really have any plan. I think the shades that we have are covering a really beautiful range. I can't see the need to, you know, add another shade unless it was maybe a, the only way we could add a pure black really would be to throw in some dyed fiber with the Merino and we don't want to do that. All right. Um, now we we do um, we do blend like I said the alpaca with merino, and um, I'm not going to go into there's a lot to say about merino, but I'm not going to go into all that. But um, the merino is that was the very first yarn we did in our very first uh, natural color club. We actually sourced the wool from another grower and they produced the yarn and everything. At that point, we were trying still to buy pre-made yarn for our clubs. Um, we hadn't gotten into producing all of it ourselves, <laughs> which when I think about it, wow, that was in some ways so much easier. <laughs> um, the, the Merino... Um, is a highly wicking fiber. It has also a high lanolin content. So the final better breakfast yarn is not a hypoallergenic yarn overall because the merino um, component adds quite a bit of, um, does have quite a bit of, of lanolin. Um, the, the, the merino fiber is also very short and very light. It has very small diameter. So that keeps it springy and, um, and gives the blend a lighter, airier feeling. Alpaca tends to be very heavy in, and despite its fineness, it's a heavy fiber. And so it will weigh down a blend that you add it to. It, it will you'll feel it when you pick up a skein that has alpaca in it. Um, and the Merino just gives it something, uh, it, it gives the, the yarn structure some space inside to trap air and keep itself springy and to add, like I say, recovery because with a sock yarn, you definitely want that. Merino can be spun very tightly because although it's very soft and very fine and very short, 
its tensile strength is very, very high. So it can be spun tight twist, it can be spun soft twist. Um, but we went with this yarn, we decided to go with a three ply construction and a softer spin, a softer um, amount of tension to it so that it would be a fingering yarn that could be used for socks but could also be used for other items like shawls and fingerless mitts and, and other things that you might want to wear um, where you don't want that overspun yarn quality to come through. So it has, it's a very versatile yarn. It, the um, ingredients in it are very high quality and also thoughtfully put together to be, to perform um, the best that they can. And I have to say, I've, um, I've knit socks for David a few times with this yarn and it is surprisingly high wear. I mean, he goes through socks easily and even, even um, commercial sock yarn with lots of nylon in it. I mean, he blows through socks in a couple of years usually and he does wear them all the time and that's why but he's a big guy and you know he just seems to wear his stuff out much more easily and his the original socks that i made with the breakfast blend yarn lasted him for four years so that's pretty for him that's like you know a marathon <laughs> a sock marathon um the original pattern that we did with this yarn was the waffle creams. That was the first pattern that I designed for the better breakfast or for the breakfast blend yarn. And then for, you know, in bringing it full circle and doing, we decided to do the holiday barn box with this yarn this year because we had never done be uh, our better breakfast in barn box or in our old club that we did, I thought, well, we should just, we should just knit it as another sock. And so um, this is the new, this is the new sock design that I developed for this yarn. It's a twist stitch pattern. The, let me get my hand inside it. If you haven't seen the photos, um, this is the, the front view. It's very, um, it's a twist stitch pattern, which I love for this yarn because it helps to give it body and strength and stabilize it. Like it, it improves the recovery of the sock itself um, and stabilizes the fabric to keep it from stretching out and not recovering. But at the same time, um, this particular slip stitch pattern is super stretchy. It's really nice and stretchy. It's not stiff at all. Um, plus it has these little ribbed panels along the side to give you a little, a little stretchiness there. It's a, it's a top down sock and it's knit with a flap heel, a slip stitch flap heel, which is my personal favorite. And um, the, design is available in three sizes and I think you could probably easily you know if you needed a really gigantic size you could probably easily increase that or you can always add if you needed a if you felt like you needed a little more width you could always just add a couple um, ribs you'd have to increase you'd have to increase by I think um, four or eight stitches to get that to work, um, but it's pretty easily resized as well. This yarn, um, well, it does feel thin when you're knitting with it. When you wash it, it does really improve. The volume is is really improved. Um, I know some. I'm. I like to knit my socks on size one needles for fingering yarn, and you know maybe like a one and a half or a two with a heavier yarn, but some people really like a more solid sock fabric and you could always knit this 
you could always go down to a zero with this yarn and it wouldn't be, it's so soft and pliable in your fingers and so buttery. It wouldn't feel too difficult to knit on an even tighter gauge if you, if you prefer that. You'd have to go up a sock size, but, but um, it would probably be really, really dense and, but still very comfortable and not uncomfortable to knit with at that density. Any questions or anything you want to say? I feel like I've been talking on and on and on. <laughs> have, Anne, have you ever been to the Buckeye Alpaca show? They, they do at it the, at Summit County Fairgrounds twice a year. Oh no, I've been yeah. down to, I've been down to the huge one in, in Columbus. At oh, they the, do, yeah, they do one in Akron twice a year. And I dragged my daughter to it a couple of years ago and I took some pictures. So here's a oh, Sir yeah. Alpaca. Uh -huh. I don't know if you showed a picture of that, but you can see the long, yeah. you know, the long coat. And I thought I had a picture of that cinnamon color that you were talking about, but I don't, yeah, I cinnamon. don't think it is. I had this little baby one, but he's not really cinnamon. He's more it's, fawn. Yeah, it's really a brown. It, it exists in the brown range. It's just that for some reason in some animals, it's super concentrated. Yeah, those ones in the background might be kind of that color. Exactly, over yeah. There. But They're yeah, almost it like was a fun. It was really fun. They are so cute. They kind of bleat like sheep. They do. And they were just... I just thought it was great. I'm going to try. I just put it on my calendar. I just looked it up. It's in March 23rd and 24th this year. Oh, and they good. do it in the fall too. They do it in November. So um, I might try to go again. Cause now that I know more about the animals and the fabric, you know, I think I would get a lot more out of it. And they, they have vendors, you know, the, the farms do their own yarns and um, they yeah. have, garments already made but um you know now that I'm more knowledgeable about it I think I would get a lot more out of it and know that would be kind of that might be kind of fun for our KAL group to do as a group as a field so, trip yeah. yeah I mean you know how everyone comes here to the shop like they're coming right in it January might be fun to, yeah it might be fun to do that in March something that to would talk be fun about. yeah it's Palm Sunday weekend is oh. what it is uh -huh. So it's the weekend before Easter. Um, uh -huh. I just put it on. So yeah, we could talk to Elizabeth about it and see about a field trip. See how people think about that. Yeah, there's also right now, somebody sent me, uh, Kent State has a knitting exhibit going on at their um, fashion design. Yeah. School. And I don't know uh, if that would be something we might want to try to do on the 21st when people are here I, i'll have to look at the hours and things like that and i'll send that to elizabeth too but um yes yeah, send it to me when you send it to her okay okay i will yeah um yeah so but the the alpacas are cool now how do they get the hair off of it they but, shear they shear how it do they, how do they de-hair the coat oh though? the de-hair is really cool um the one at the mill that we work with worked with was a box it, it looked like a big box um like a big furniture box and they run the fiber through on a conveyor belt and it has a hot this vacuum and the vacuum is set at a certain velocity that pulls the hair but leaves the fiber and huh. and they would draw all the hair out and then they would um they would make this, um, it comes out like in a tubular, like a sausage almost. And they would make this, um, it was a yarn, but it was like a compacted yarn. It was like a singles, but it was like that big around. And they would, um, they had a, a machine that, that could stitch it into circles and ovals to make rugs. So mm -hmm. they made rugs with it and um, it's so cushy underfoot. And then they had a felting machine. They could felt the rug together. So they had all kinds of things they were doing with that. And they gave me, I have a bump over there. It's a, a big bump of the, of that stuff. The hair, yeah. <laughs> that they took out of our yarn when they were making our yarn one time. Oh, 
yeah. yeah. It's probably like two pounds of that, um, you know, to stitch into a rug or something. Yeah. Christy, any questions? So many questions. <laughs> no, I, I don't have any questions, but I found the whole um, explanation just incredibly fascinating because I love alpaca. Mm -hmm. it wasn't. And um, it's just so interesting to hear what, you know, what the Incas were doing with it and how the span now I'm of Spanish descent, how we Spaniards uh, kind of wrecked things in a, in a certain <laughs> way, you know, but we did that wherever we went. So, <laughs> well, not unlike, you know, the British or, you know, a lot of, um, a lot of Western civilizations, went out there and wreaked havoc in the world and um you know um everyone's i guess but you know it it might have been some other culture that did the same thing mm -hmm. it's you know i'm sure the incans conquered subculture mm -hmm. on their own continent in their rise to power yeah. so but but it would be it would be nice if if the if globally more of the native processes all over the world have been maintained and i just think it's more we're you know we would have ended up with a more with a better future for the planet in that case Yes. True. But that's, Very true. That's water under the bridge. Yep. We can't do anything about that now. Not now. Except not do it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I like that Peru, uh, you know, was so strict um, about the alpaca. Yeah. Um, so it's, just, it's like um, many of the, um, the, ancient fibers like silk and um cotton you know there are all these really interesting histories behind them as to how you know and we're so fortunate that those cultures did all that that it's fascinating that in modern times we think of them as primitive cultures when mm -hmm. they had all these highly specialized skills and processes and um techniques that we are actually benefiting from you know Definitely. well even like the production of flax you know that that's that's pretty amazing but i did have a question so you said that um alpaca and um their relatives were were they down more in the coastal areas and then got driven up into the mountain yeah. okay yes mm -hmm. So then I'm, did the fiber change? It must have, right? Somewhat. Well, yes. And it's, um, it changed for a variety of reasons for, you know, first of all, the interbreeding changed the fiber and also the climactic conditions do definitely changed it. And right. that, you know, that might be for the best, mm -hmm. but, um, we won't know. We don't know. No. <laughs> we, we don't have those fabrics with us anymore i'm working on the sock by the way i'm oh nice yeah you yeah. showed it yesterday yeah there. so are you, are you enjoying it yeah i like it i i am doing um a sweater with the better breakfast worsted but i hadn't used the fingering and i assume the worsted doesn't have the nylon in it right no the the um the dkm worsted do not so they have a yeah. slight different proportion the proportion of the merino and the um alpaca is the same it just um the 10 percent nylon is distributed evenly between the two so yeah. yeah yeah i mean i liked it in the worsted and i'm liking this these are going to be nice socks i'm going to really like these socks and the worsted weight is a two ply where the dk and fingering weight are both three plies so they're a little more they're a little smoother and more durable probably too. I put a link in the chat 
for the Indian Textile Arts Organization. If y'all are interested in that kind of thing, they do a lot with Indian textile arts and, mm -hmm. and working toward preserving that and doing education in regard to the whole traditional textile area there. Yeah, I haven't um I haven't been fortunate enough to travel there myself, but um I have friends who have and it's really interesting. And actually our, our marketing person, Michelle, she's from she's from um Ecuador. So she's she knows all about all that stuff. <laughs> So that's our little taste of bar box for the holidays. Although I think most of you are already subscribers. So I won't, I don't have to talk you into subscribing. <laughs> and as subscribers in two weeks, we have another bar box. So your January bar box yarn is on its way. I can't wait to talk about it. I have enjoyed every minute of knitting with it. It's delicious. And, um, and the barn box talk will be on what day? The 28th. Okay. Because it comes out on the 17th and that Sunday is a little too close. Like I'm, I want everybody to have their yarn before we do the talk. Plus we have a group coming. Um, we have our regional knit along group coming on the 21st to visit the shop. So, um, the people who kind of live around here come in and then on the 28th we'll do our barn box chat for that i'm trying to think what else we have going on oh um at the end of january we will be doing our valentine's kit so we're working on that and it's very pretty last year was so nice that mm -hmm. yes i love you shawl i love that thing and i love the yarn that came with it so that we're doing so so um that's all i have for today